Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Fermansky, and I'm a features journalist for Juris News. Today, we are speaking with Raul Bajaj. Raul Bajaj currently works with the VD Center for Legal Policy, an independent think tank doing legal research to make better laws and improve governance for the public good. Prior to VD, Raul was a judicial clerk with the Supreme Court Justice D.Y. Chandrachud. In this role, alongside discharging the traditional responsibilities of a judicial clerk, Raul spearheaded a series of initiatives to make digital infrastructure of the legal in Indian legal system more accessible for the disabled. This included making the websites of all high courts more disabled friendly, pushing for the use of more accessible PDFs and permanent institutional solutions to access to address the accessibility barriers on an ongoing basis. Raul Bajaj is an Indian lawyer who graduated from Nagpur University in 2017 as a gold medalist. He read law at the University of Oxford as an Indian Rhodes Scholar. Prior to attending Oxford, Raul worked with top tier full service law firm as an associate in India. Deeply interested in intellectual property and constitutional law, Raul was a fellow for a leading intellectual property law blog called Spicy IP and has written articles on a large array of hot button constitutional law issues for several leading platforms in the field. Blind since birth, Raul is deeply committed to the cause of making, legal e the, making the legal ecosystem accessible to lawyers with disabilities and has spearheaded many initiatives to this end. Last December, a book co-authored by him was released called It Can Be Done, IDAP interview series. The book contains interviews of 21 legal professionals with disabilities from six countries. Thank you so much, Raul, for agreeing to an interview with Juris Legal News and Commentary. How are you this evening? Thanks, Michelle, uh, for that very kind introduction. I am doing very well, and it's an honor to be with you here. I was hoping that we could start this with just a a brief overview of your career and your life so far, just to understand, you know, of where you were and where you've come to now. Sure. Um, so I guess your introduction was quite comprehensive in terms of tracing the arc of my journey so far. As you've pointed out, uh, I am uh, blind since birth. I hail from a city called Nagpur in the central part of India. I went to school here and uh, junior college also, which is the period between uh, ages 16 to 18 for a non-Indian audience. And then when it came to studying law, I decided to study in my hometown. I did not go to any of the national law universities or leading national law school, leading law schools uh, in the country located in other cities. So I wanted to remain in the family and at home, and we can go into the reasons for that in a bit, uh, if you would like to. But, uh, so I, I studied here for five years between 2012 and 17. After that, I, as you've noted, uh, you've pretty much captured, I think, the trajectory of my career since then in terms of the law firm work I did and went to Oxford um, and, yeah, and then coming back and clocking. Oh, so I think um, I have um, sort of, you know, been able to work towards uh, the objectives that I've set for myself at different stages of my career. And of course, have faced several barriers along the way, which we will talk about as we go along. But in short, I guess that is how I would describe my journey. Right, right. And you know, you alluded to the change in universities. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. Yeah. So I think uh, the, the the choice of university you asked. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, uh, so back in 2012, uh, when, when it was time for me to choose, uh, you know, where I wanted to study law, I either had the option to give law entrance exams and secure admission 
at a leading law school nationally or to get into you know one of the other law schools like uh, like those in pune or mumbai which which aren't national law schools but which still are on the map and have fairly reasonable infrastructure and uh, facilities in terms of the pursuit of your aspirations but the at that stage my thought process was that it would make sense for me to stay with my family where i had access to a robust support system in terms of being able to have someone uh, you know who could attend to my daily needs whether it be cooking cleaning the utensils ensuring that you know i was able to stay well organized going uh, to college and coming back home mobility within the city all of which i had uh, at home which i wouldn't have had if i had gone elsewhere so even though it made sense to go out from the perspective of you know all the reasons why people go to big universities for these reasons i chose not to do that and uh, i think in hindsight it was not the right decision to make because uh, it really meant that i couldn't um use those years in a productive way to cultivate the kinds of relationships that people cultivate you know long lasting friendships mm-hmm. uh and forging those deep connections that that really hold you in good stead for the rest of your life but on the flip side it did mean that i had to be much more self motivated and driven to remain competitive and to be able to cultivate the skills that would make me a serious candidate when it came to pursuing opportunities nationally and internationally what do you think was the biggest lesson that you learned from that experience i think the importance of stepping out of your comfort zone and addressing the barriers that come in the way of doing that so for me staying at home was my comfort zone and back then i don't think i really had the courage and confidence to push myself out of my comfort zone since then i have been very consciously uh, in try to consciously ensure that whenever i have two choices in front of me one amongst one the one of which appears the easier path to pursue in and the other one is harder but in the long term will be more beneficial that i do the latter mm-hmm. so that's one immediate take away that i think that thought right and you spoke about staying in the university that you did because of uh, access to your family and ways to have a more accessible life did you find that your life with university life was more accessible where you went or do you think that it fell short in that regard there was no university life as such honestly it meant so staying at home meant that the burden of making the most of the experience really fell upon me which me which meant for instance that you know we i mean we, we wouldn't have classes regularly and even when we would have them either students wouldn't turn up because there were no meaningful at- attendance requirements mandatory attendance requirements mm-hmm. or the teachers were so bad that there was no point in actually going because they would just read from the book and sort of you know uh, leave it at that so it really became a question of figuring out how i could access academic content on my own mm-hmm. sit on my own and read legal commentaries try to understand them when it came to pursuing internships it meant figuring out contacts on my own and trying to put in my applications and then pursuing them with vigor and you know in a proactive way to see where it would land up uh, rather than having campus placement cells or notices put up on, on on the board or a strong alumni network that could shepherd me through these processes as is the case with people who come from leading universities you know it meant uh 
figuring out it meant spending more time doing internships and practically oriented training than in the classroom because uh because that is what i knew was really going to help me get somewhere it meant being willing to live with the limitations that that kind of an education brought with it uh, you know for instance um, just a couple of examples i'll give you one that uh, you know moot court activities are a very core part of most law students life uh, mm -hmm. when they are in law school but for me that wasn't something that i could really do because i didn't have access to teammates who were you know of the same mindset and because you see most people who as in they are perfectly good people i don't have anything against them as as individuals right. but in terms of quality in terms of you know intellectual thirst that kind of thing you weren't really going to find here realistically mm -hmm. so you couldn't really get that sort of a team going so you had to figure out ways of publishing independently and like you said i used to blog a lot so those ways where you didn't have to depend on anyone else it also meant for instance that uh, there were things that i didn't learn back then which still uh, in some sense keep me back sometimes you know? so for instance i never used jstor as a database to conduct research and i didn't even mm -hmm. know exactly how it worked until a few months ago mm -hmm. um and that's something that people pick up intuitively from their uh, from their peers uh, when they are in law school so i have largely been self taught and uh, while that has had its benefit it has also had some significant shortcomings I can understand that and I'm sure so many people can empathize with your situation of you know wanting that intellectual curiosity around them and just not finding it. Besides, you know, writing blogs and finding ways, did you find any mentors within that environment that could guide you or were you isolated in that regard as well? No, I did have access to mentors and that was something that really helped me uh you know rise beyond the circumscribed circumstances that i was living in so for instance i there was this one professor i had who sadly passed away earlier this year mm -hmm. uh who is uh, who was also blind and uh, he used to head the postgraduate department of law uh, at nagpur university where i was studying he um uh, went to oxford back in the day in the 80s in 88 89 uh, on the commonwealth scholarship and then taught at a leading law school for a couple of years in some sense he was also he also spent his life sort of chafing at the limitation that his disability imposed upon him mm -hmm. um but was an extremely well read person who didn't let the you know the narrowness of the circumstances around him really curtail his ambitions his intellectual sort of uh, you know the, the amount of reading he did his, his intellectual outlook etc so he was someone i definitely looked up to another uh, person uh, i would say was um, you know uh, someone uh, with uh, with a blindness who again i knew from nagpur who had studied law a couple of decades before me and you know i would reach out to him from time to time he had also secured a large number of medals which was at the time the record um so you know i i could reach out to him for advice and guidance from time to time and then there were people i met in the course of my internships with whom i stayed in touch thereafter mm -hmm. also so it seems like you could build yourself quite the support network in that sense i was able to yes i mean i the the onus fell upon me more than it would have if i had gone to like i said you know mm -hmm. law school which would have which had the infrastructure that would make that possible yeah. so therefore in that sense i did have to cultivate my own connections and my own networks and that is what i have tried to do right so you've definitely had to develop a, a modem of self sufficiency on that point that's right you mentioned england and you know as a road scholar studying at oxford i wanted to hear more about your experience there and any differences that you saw in the education and in the accessibility between 
your university in India and in England? Yeah, so I think the main difference that I really noticed, uh, and I think these questions really go together in terms of accessibility as well as the differences that I noticed. I think mm -hmm. the main difference really was the existence of a robust support system to address my needs on the academic front at least. So, you know, universities like Oxford have what is called a disability advisory service where you can, um, which, which contacts you once you get admitted to Oxford and uh, where you can articulate what your additional needs are and then they put in place the support to make that available whether it is making sure that your reading materials are made available on time, scanning for you, mm -hmm. uh, chasing publishers for them if they have to do that, um, letting your professors know what your additional needs are, uh, you know, making sure that you have exam-related accommodations that you need, providing you access to a cited, in the, in the case of those who are visually challenged, access to a cited support worker who can read things out to you if that needs mm -hmm. to be done, can mm -hmm. help you with note-taking, those kinds of things. So the full panoply of facilities can be accessed uh, on the academic front. And in India, very few universities, if any, have that sort of an infrastructure in place, that sort of infrastructure in place. So therefore, the consequence of that really is that in the Indian context, if you did want to access these facilities, what you would have to do is to you know you you'd have to arrange for these things on your own uh, and if you're financially well off well connected then you can otherwise you can't so the, the institutional support in that sense is lacking uh, for whatever reason however mm -hmm. on the non-academic front it was certainly a much more significant challenge because uh, i hadn't lived away from home at all before i went to oxford Mm -hmm. um, I'd always lived either at home or with my mother and therefore having to live alone meant that uh, you know I had to figure out how to uh, cook for myself, how to uh, stay well organized, mobility, my mobility skills had to be bolstered so that I could go to places independently and on mm -hmm. that front uh, there was very little by way of support that the university could provide but I was lucky in that I was at Oxford on the road scholarship, which meant that uh, they were able to chip in and offer funding for sighted support mm -hmm. for some of those things till the time that I became better at doing them myself. So I, yeah, that, that is how my experience works. I see. And you alluded to the factor of class and socioeconomic status and just simply wealth and when it comes to accessibility, especially in India. Would you mind expanding a little bit more on that? I think it is it is the case that uh, in a society like ours, which is a developing country where there are limited resources, the disabled aren't sometimes seen as a priority group for whom support uh, systems need to be put in place. So part of it is that, part of it is that there hasn't been until now, at least until 2016, the law that we had on disability rights was fairly, had become fairly outdated. So it didn't really mandate the kind of support systems that are provided in the West because perhaps even in the West, if it were left to people's own devices they may not have really done the kind of work that they've done but now that there are legal obligations whether it be to the americans with disabilities act in the us or the equality mm -hmm. act in england there are legal obligations that you have to comply with and that means that you know you go out of your way not to be found on the wrong side of the law so that is one part of it um for, for all these reasons and also the disabled population perhaps being better organized and more assertive essentially and more confident of their needs, the consequence 
becomes that uh, people are a lot more, uh, that that they are provided a lot more institutional support whether it be uh, in college uh, graduate school at the workplace and to be able to access the kinds of accommodations i've already alluded to and therefore your own wherewithal to arrange for those resources becomes less critical so for instance being able to buy screen reading software that speaks out the content mm-hmm. on the computer screen right for a blind person like that kind of thing is funded in the us and in india it's not as in un- with some exceptions here and there so you know therefore class and socio economic status plays a role in the sense that you are able to lift yourself out of the circumstances that you find yourself in only if you are well off and can afford the support that you need in that circumstance you may actually be better positioned than someone in the west also sometimes because you know you have the resources to afford let's say a driver which which is not very common in the west uh, when it comes to traveling independent in india you can afford human labor fair relatively easily so a lot mm-hmm. does turn on those factors for a disabled person in india right right and the law that you spoke about in india that was recently passed to provide more accommodations for people who are disabled in india do you see that the changes there progressing quickly or slowly and is there any resistance from the general community towards this act so i think um it 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 has yes and no in terms of whether it has progressed sufficiently it has i think in some ways progress uh, fairly quickly and in some ways not so much uh, let me explain what i mean by that so um when it comes to the judicial interpretation of the law that's been fairly robust and there was a leading supreme court judgment passed 6 months ago around 6 months ago in february that uh, adopted by this uh, that that adopted a fairly robust interpretation of the law and of its guarantees and mm-hmm. called upon the government to ensure their meaningful implementation uh, which i think has to rank as one of the more progressive disability rights judgments globally uh, by any apex court uh, so there is that sense of uh, the law being a transformative tool that if utilized properly can have very powerful effects um there's also you know people have filed a uh, series of lawsuits petitions uh to be able to access uh, digital technologies which are inaccessible um and and things like that so in that in that sense there is more to work with with the law Mm-hmm. however uh, it has also in some sense moved slowly because the fact of the matter really remains that um uh, there aren't there aren't really the uh, you know like that there, there, there isn't enough pressure on the government to really implement the law effectively so for instance um some provisions of the law are of a time bound nature they require that you make accessible in uh, the infrastructure accessible within in 5 years and i don't know the exact durations for everything but those timelines have not been complied with all government websites had to become accessible within 2 years i think of the date on which rules were promulgated under the law and that hasn't yet happened since and there are, it's been four years since those rules were promulgated so in some ways it has moved slowly also mm-hmm. so do you find that the only course of action in those cases is through lawsuits and through the courts effectively to get that enforced or is there more of a grassroots movement happening trying to have these changes Uh, progress faster and actually be held to their timetable 
yeah uh, so it has to be both um mm-hmm. and it often is um mm-hmm. and the two have to work in tandem in order to be able to produce meaningful impact so in terms of um, i think beyond a point there is one does need to offer a judicial route because if you do make the effort to try and convince people to change their practices that are inaccessible and discriminatory mm-hmm. and when that does not yield positive results then you are left with no choice but to utilize the law and i have personally experienced that also um so i guess in some sense you do have to resort to that ideally the way to do it is to generate greater awareness about the law about the legal entitlements that it contains for the disabled uh, so that people end up knowing more about what it is that they have to do under the law in order to ensure that you know they are not found on the wrong side of it and they themselves take the measure that are necessary uh but when that doesn't work then you do need to opt for legal debt right can you elaborate on the experience that you alluded to with the courts and law in your own case right so yeah of course so i guess so i have in the last couple of years been engaged in conversation well conversation would be a mild way to put it i have been engaged in an effort to uh, make sure that a legal a leading legal database in india that provides uh, you know search database which is used for the purposes of accessing judgments and statutes mm-hmm. uh, and other things um that that be made more accessible to people with disabilities because mm-hmm. at present or at least at that stage it was very inaccessible um in terms of how the website was designed and how you could get to various resources on it mm-hmm. um and it's called scc online which is uh, an authentic considered the most authentic resource for finding judgments authentic in the sense that what you find there can actually be cited in court mm. because other databases aren't considered that authentic so you won't be able to cite their material in court directly mm-hmm. um and that is important um in litigation especially if you are in that branch of law now what happened in this and in the context of this act or is that we did um, we meaning me and a couple of other disability rights lawyers um, activists did try to reach out to them to point out what accessibility issues existed on the platform mm-hmm. that needed to be addressed however uh, the service provider either never responded to us or when they did they were dismissive they balked at any attempts to tell them what their legal obligations were and acted as though this wasn't something worthy of their time and attention so therefore uh we then did decide to opt for a uh, legal remedies because uh it was clear although they were running a legal database and sort of should have known better and mm-hmm. they weren't really sensitive to their obligations uh, uh, as a legal matter let alone as a humanitarian one so then um, you know we uh, we have been in the process of thinking through our legal options uh, to be able to get them to work better but now i feel that that may not be that necessary because of two reasons one that in the past few months uh they have become a little better although i don't think that is because they've tried to make themselves more accessible it's just a happy byproduct of website changes that they've made otherwise mm-hmm. um and they still remain quite inaccessible uh, but it has gotten better and the second reason is that alternatives to that have appeared so in the context of the work i was doing at the supreme court this past year one of the things we did was to work on the launch of and it is now live a uh, platform a uh, search engine um, 
for locating judgments of all the high courts on uh, you know on an online platform which 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 is considered authentic mm -hmm. uh, and therefore that really obviates the need for this platform to be used all that much for SCC online to be used all that much. Right. I'm sorry that you had to deal with the dismissiveness of that legal search engine, um, but I'm very happy to hear that there has been an alternative that has been released recently. So yeah. I'm sure many people have to thank you for that. Um, you mentioned being involved in these like very interesting legal discourses and, and thoughts and battles when it comes to your own experience. I, are these experiences what motivated you to go into law in the first place or, or what attracted you into law to have that type of recourse in situations where you were dismissed by people? I think yes, uh, in part it did play a role. It wasn't the only reason, but it mm -hmm. was one of the major, one of the major or minor I won't really be able to say, but it was one of the factors that motivated me um to pursue law as an opportunity as an avenue to address meaningfully the barriers that i saw around me and the discrimination mm -hmm. and challenges that i saw around me in a meaningful sense because i knew that uh, it was perhaps one of the only ways if not the only way in which to be able to ventilate those grievances uh, mm -hmm. in an effective way and obtain some sort of a solution uh, that that actually everyone had to comply with and had to had to bow down to so mm -hmm. that was definitely a factor i mean there were other factors also that drew me to the law um but this was one of them yes mm -hmm. do you find that efforts to improve accessibility are, are more successful on the judicial side instead of the legislative side? Or do you think that um, it's, it's about the same? That's a really good question. And I think in some sense they are. Indian courts have shown a willingness to adopt a fairly progressive uh, approach when it comes to a series of disability rights issues that have come before them. Mm -hmm. It'd be, uh, you know, making sure that the provision that exists on reservation, which is, so we have, unlike the US, um, uh, you know, affirmative action in the form of a quota system where you do have to resolve under the earlier law, 3% under the new law, 4% of seats for persons with disabilities mm -hmm. in specified institutions. Uh, and there, there have been a lot of roadblocks in getting those provisions implemented. Uh, similarly, in the context of uh, you know, discrimination at the workplace or um, making sure that other reasonable accommodation, making sure that reasonable accommodation requests were complied with in those contexts, courts have definitely come mm -hmm. to the aid of the disabled uh, a lot more than the legislature has because the legislature essentially made a law in 1995 and then sat with folded hands at the central level at least right. um, before the new law was signed. Um, and uh, but then equally, courts have uh, also disappointed on certain occasions. For instance, there was this 2019 ruling by the Supreme Court, uh, which affirmed a rule as per which someone with more than 50% visual or hearing impairment could not become a judge. The Supreme Court essentially said that this was a reasonable restriction to have and that it was fair for people whose visual or hearing impairment with excess of 50 percent mm -hmm. from being excluded from becoming judges it was an extremely backward looking uh regressive view that they uh, that betrayed a profoundly regressive understanding of the rights and capabilities of the disabled so those kinds of rulings also do exist on our statute on our, on our books uh and uh 
and therefore i while they have certainly been more active than the legislature i wouldn't say that uh, they've really always covered themselves in duty when it comes to upholding the rights of the disabled mm -hmm. and when it comes to upholding those rights and enforcing these different measures or you know changing things that people expose in different studies and things like that do you find that the barriers or in the attitudes that people have is it economically motivated is it just ignorance to the issue is it um a misunderstanding of of how valuable these things are what do you think motivates people to not really care as much or, or comply with these issues in your eyes at least i think it's a combination of all the three factors that you enumerated sometimes it is because of lack of economic resources and they choose not to be inclusive so they think that they don't really have the financial wherewithal to be able to purchase the technology that an employee with blind might need or effectively they might feel that making their office space physically accessible more to the disabled would be too much of an investment for them to make of mm -hmm. money that would be better spent in activities that could yield greater revenues so in some right. cases it could be a function of economic uh, consideration uh they might feel that it would they would be better off hiring someone either without a disability because we are much financial effort and mm -hmm. that much of a financial strain on them it's also the second factor where they even if they have good intention they just do not know what they should do or how it should be done mm -hmm. uh, and and therefore they end up either not doing anything at all or you know, either they sort of don't do anything at all because they just feel that well what's the point mm -hmm. uh, really or they don't want to learn and sort of end up causing more harm than all kinds of things can happen and sometimes it can also be the the third thing that you mentioned about uh, just it being very low on the priority list uh which is in some sense linked with the first one uh when it comes to the priority that organizations have institute other any kind of institution uh, i think the main factor though and this sort of in some sense sometimes feeds into the other is the second one which is the lack of know how or ignorance more than a gen or then a you know and more than bad intent or more than lack of resources mm -hmm. so very often what needs to be done is it even that expensive and is it even that difficult to do all it requires is an open mind some empathy and sensitivity and the willingness to learn how someone might do something slightly differently from what you do it more mm -hmm. than a little tarago in the adjustment of the way you work or a very heavy investment of these sorts of things like that. It sounds like beyond just funding, there needs to be a cultural shift of priorities uh, to emphasize inclusivity. Um, but I think this is applicable to countries in the west as well not just in india so it is i think it's only a matter of degree perhaps in terms of how they differ um because in the west since there have been more positive examples in some sense of disabled people in the popular consciousness and the law also we shouldn't underestimate the role of the law mm -hmm. in setting expectations and exacting compliance very often um even if people don't know what to do aren't really keen to do it and they are required to do so sticks work better than carrots or anything else in some mm -hmm. so do you find that compliance is is better in places like england and the us than in india do you find that people respect or fear the rule of law in these cases more undoubtedly i think because uh fact of the matter is that laws have existed 
on disability rights there which are progressive in nature mm -hmm. for a far longer duration and have therefore got themselves entrenched more deeply mm -hmm. into these societies um which therefore then means that um people are more aware of what non-compliance would entail and mm -hmm. act accordingly so I think it's absolutely right at least the way currently think, the way things currently stand. Right. And in your experience as a law clerk at the Supreme Court of India, do you find that you have any firsthand experience in, in seeing this change or um, do you see that this culture and attitude has been shifting since you've worked there or has the insider perspective changed your perspective of the whole process? In terms of compliance with the law when it comes to disability rights, you mean? Yes, more generally? yes. Um, and then we can speak more generally as well if you'd like. I think there is certainly uh, the law, and then I guess the one thing that I didn't really realize in the course of my clerkship and discipline was the positive role that the law can play in uh, changing ground realities in a very concrete way. So, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, there are very progressive provisions in our disability rights law mm -hmm. and in the course of my clerkship especially in the work that we did on making the legal infrastructure digital infrastructure of the more accessible to the disabled as you well were doing the introduction mm -hmm. a lot of it was grounded in the law that currently exists so when people know what their legal obligations are at least in the legal system they do try to comply with them the extent that they are able to. Uh, and I think it's also true that people need to acquire, and this is also something that is lacking in India, mm -hmm. the ability to utilize the law effectively uh, to push back against discriminatory practices or unjust practices. So, for instance, um, in the U.S., I know that the, that the National Federation for the Blind does very meaningful advocacy work using the ADA, um, mm -hmm. as do some other lawyers, disability rights lawyers. I don't think, with the exception of some, or really just one, uh, you know, proponent, uh, one one person who has used uh, our disability rights law to great effect and has been able to push its frontiers. Uh, constantly in the last few years if we if we exclude him there hasn't really been much by way of even utilizing what we already have because there is a lot not just under the new law but also under the uncrpd uh, that india can work with uh, to make things better uh, mm -hmm. so i think what i have come to realize is that when people do go to court with petition that are well framed where the cause of action is clearly identified and they are able to articulate exactly what provision they are relying on and what sort of relief they want then there is definitely uh, the room for progressive uh, developments to take place but differently i have come to realize that a lot of actors are willing to change and are willing to comply with their obligations once it's made clear to them what those are. Right. So, so you find that a lack of clarity is, is part of the problem as well, of people not understanding the expectation. Clarity, more than clarity, I think it's lack of awareness, as everyone mm -hmm. likes to say. It's kind of become the buzzword for a lot of things, a lot of social issues when we talk about awareness and sensitivity. But that is what it really boils down to uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I think I don't think it's really anything more than that. And then there are some, of course, unfounded biases also that exist that, oh, look, 
if we if we provide this accommodation to this disabled person will that not open up a pandora's box where we'll have mm-hmm. to start making available all kinds of support uh, uh, all all forms of support to you know all kind of disabled people what will that do for our resources etc etc so those kinds of un- unfounded concerns do exist but i think they can be persuasively countered it's not beyond uh it's not incontestable i think it's just that one needs to uh be very strategic about it you know you have to see disability rights issues not through a charity based lens or through a uh, lens of oh you know doing something with a good intent but in a very practically oriented level headed manner and then you should go to court and you can obtain relief of course our courts work within the existing constraints that that are imposed on them in terms of cost in terms of how long it takes for legal resolution to be reached up very mindful of those broader constraints but i guess that's a conversation for another day but if we keep that to one side for the moment i think there is definitely progress that can be i i really like your your point about common sense instead of charity as an approach to these different issues i think that that was a very great way of of putting it and also of outlining what it should be like in the future um mm-hmm. i guess a question that i have and i'm sure many of the people have is you know for some people they i i guess i just want to know your opinion do you think that these efforts need to be advocated for exclusively by people with disabilities themselves or do you find that the role of people who ally themselves with a the cause um still effective or or do you find that because you know someone without disabilities fights for the cause they don't understand it well enough to advocate to the full extent do you think that the identity of the person advocating for it matters in that sense i think it is undoubtedly true that someone that that it is in disabled people alone can make things better over a period of time the the cooperation support goodwill empathy positive action by others around them is absolutely critical uh now sometimes that can do sometimes that can cause harm also because as you somewhat flicked at in your question it is the case that the able bodied sometimes just do not know how to help or what to do for so for instance they might try to poor compensate uh you know in terms of going out of their way to give a blind person in the room trying to take them to a chair and get them to sit there when they actually don't need that kind of support mm-hmm. or speaking too loudly to them when it's actually visual impairment that they have the hearing yeah. issue those kinds of things which i'm sure as an enlightened individual as an like familiar with as someone who well, well informed uh so i think uh those are con- the those are genuine concerns but the way to get around it is not for people to not be invested at all the able body to be invested at all in the cause of the disabled mm-hmm. just to make themselves better informed and just to ask more and to learn and sometimes it's okay to commit some mistakes along the way also but as long as you just don't care i think that's really what makes me quite sad and i'll give you one example you i found when i was in oxford a lot of the time work we did on disability rights issues at roads house for instance which was the home of the roads scholarship which which i pursued while i was there we started doing some events on disability rights issues we started mm-hmm. this workshop called just ask uh which was aimed at fostering dialogue on how the concrete challenges that disabled people faced 
Oxford scholars with disabilities faced in Oxford on an everyday basis, how those could be more effectively tackled. And uh, what we found in the second iteration, at least of the workshop and some of the other events that we did, was that not many able-bodied people would turn up for these events. Only disabled people would, and some of their friends would, just because they knew that the disabled person was going for it. Somehow there is the belief in the able-bodied community that these issues don't apply to them at all. So there mm. isn't, like for instance, something as simple as using image descriptions of the pictures you put up on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. That's something that anyone who has a blind friend, visually challenged friend, um, would know to do or would know at least to find out how to do, even if they don't do it now. It could be that they've not met someone yet with a disability, with visual disability, and haven't had to do it. But once they know someone and yet choose not to do it, I think that's really where the problem lies, where they just don't, where they aren't considerate enough, or maybe think that it's too much work. I don't know. I mean, the causes for it are. But to my mind, it is true that the support of the able bodied is absolutely critical. To answer your original question, a well-meaning support is even better. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be small little things that make the world a little bit better uh, every, every single day. And I think it's just if you observe, if you ask, first thing is to make assumptions and to not do anything for fear of doing the wrong thing. I think those two things you should not do. Mm -hmm. what advice can you give to the able-bodied community um on you know either how to approach someone with disabilities on on how to ask in a manner that is you know polite and, and not condescending or or um how they can best reach out and help someone even if they don't know them uh, i think like I said, uh, the workshop we did, it's really about just learning, to just asking. And when it comes to figuring out how to just ask, I think, and as you say, in a polite way that isn't, uh, that isn't condescending or that isn't offensive, I think it's just displaying genuine curiosity and asking. Mm -hmm. I could give you a couple of examples to demonstrate different approaches that people might adopt so one person might say i can't believe that you can do this how can you do it mm. versus can you tell me how it is that you are able to get this done what are what is the way in which you do it mm -hmm. same okay. question but it's fundamentally okay. different uh, ways of asking it. Right, right. You, know, you could um, you could ask them, sort of, you know, mm -hmm. I was I I I was under the impression that this is how you might do this. Is that right? Right. Uh, versus being like, oh, like being a bit of a know it all, you know, right. and sort of trying to understand how they might do things even for asking them. Right. Um, I think uh, the important thing is really to uh, recognize that if, if you don't ask, then it's much worse because right. you'll continue to have assumptions uh, which will hold your relationship with them back or which will prevent you from offering them support when they need it. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the other side to it is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a disabled person who knows uh, the able-bodied person. And your question was about someone who doesn't know. And I, I, I am aware of that. But if you do know someone already, then there is, at least to my mind, some good faith, a presumption of good faith that you attach to them. So it's not like one question is going to turn someone away. 
uh, mm-hmm. you know but if you just find it too awkward or too loaded or too difficult or unpleasant to ask then that sends a really negative message to the mm-hmm. disabled person as though they are somehow making you uncomfortable right and that's not a good feeling to have for anyone uh you know american supreme court justice sonia sotomayor has this book uh, which was the basis for the workshop also that we did for just ask be different be brave be you where she portrays this garden that a bunch of disabled kids get together and plant together and there she emphasizes the importance of asking questions when you just don't how someone with disability does certain things and that's that's how one can move forward right so just asking with kindness then do you find yeah simple though that is it's yeah. <laughs> hard to practice sometimes it's it's, it's 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 just that simple essentially right do you find yeah. that you know you've worked in in various jobs you've clerked with the supreme court of india you were an associate at a top tier firm and now you're a fellow at the vd center for legal policy do you find that you've been met with a lot of um that more well intentioned communication um and has accessibility been been a dialogue in those cases and have you felt that you've been able to influence the different like levels of accessibility within those places Michelle I think in the Indian context it's often not really so much of a dialogue as it is to be very honest with you mm-hmm. as it is a question of you having the willingness to assert yourself right Right. the fact of the matter is that there is this belief in some authors that somehow bringing up the disability a they may not know that they need to bring it up and offer reasonable accommodation at all because mm-hmm. they've never had someone with disability before or mm-hmm. b they might feel that this would be centralizing the person it would be bringing up an uncomfortable subject mm-hmm. so why do that uh, and hence they may choose not to do it at all mm-hmm. uh, so the fact of the matter is uh, and this goes back to the conversation we were having about obtaining support at university that it becomes a question of you being able to reach out to your employer and this is what i have done in my two jobs till now and tell them that these are the additional needs that i have mhm this is how i can get certain things done so can you support me in this or that way right. once they are told of that then they definitely willing to at least in my experience so far people are definitely willing to provide you the support that you need and especially mm-hmm. at the supreme court i had a very positive experience because i was working for a judge who was very understanding and progressive and empathetic but also not patronizing and uh, doing it in the sense of doing a favor which is a very difficult line to tread but judges tread difficult lines all the mm-hmm. time so don't think it's anything new for him but yeah the that is something that should be appreciated i suppose um but the ideal scenario would be for organizations to have equal opportunity policies to have um, so in england for instance they divide reasonable accommodation into two categories uh, ex ante and ex post or anticipatory accommodations and uh, individualized accommodations if i'm getting the terms right anticipatory accommodations are those that you arrange for every disabled person like based on their disability mm-hmm. uh, and th- those operate regardless of what your specific needs are so those should definitely be there and then there can be accommodations that are made in consultation with the disabled person once they arrive mm-hmm. in the organization here we only have the latter to the extent that we have anything at all right right do you 
were you able to, well, okay, first of all, I just want to know that it seems like every person in India who has disabilities has to end up being their own lawyer, in a sense, their own advocate, which yes. is very unfair. Um, yes. But in your, you mentioned that you really found the accessibility uh, to be really helpful and, and well organized at the Supreme Court. Was that your best work experience when it came to accessibility or did you, at your current job, are you, do you have a very good experiences with um, speaking so about accessibility? Sorry. Yeah, no, no, finish your question. Is, is that it? Yeah, it's effectively just more of a comparison uh, between the different places you've worked in and how central accessibility was to your good experience there and whether you felt that you were very heard and were people receptive to the changes that you needed them to make. Yeah, so I think uh, both as in the third job at the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy is going to start this coming Monday. So I haven't yeah. uh, <laughs> started that yet. So can't, that really, <laughs> yes, I can't really speak to how things will be there, although I initial the initial signs are positive. Uh, between the two jobs that I have done so far, I, I, I'd say I've had positive experiences doing both of them uh, from an accessibility standpoint. Uh, the Supreme Court one was particularly positive because the judge really went out of his way to offer additional support mm. in the sense of reaching out on his own multiple times to ask me what accessibility related needs I had telling me that this was one time he even went so far as to say that this fight is as much yours as it is mine, mm. um, you know, and uh, made sure that he reached out to relevant actors on my behalf when the need for that arose. For instance, when I started working at the Supreme Court I remember that uh, one issue that I faced was that they used visual captchas to be able to access different facets of the website, oh. uh, which are completely inaccessible for a blind person. Right. And they didn't have text or audio captchas as substitutes for them. And that is how the position was for a couple of months after I started. But this was brought to his attention and he ensured that they were able to, he was able to cut through the red tape and get a text and audio capture introduced. And I write this right in this article that I uh, am currently writing on my clerkship, uh, that that was no less than the court opening its either two closed gates for me uh, as a mm -hmm. disabled person, uh, because the capture is the entry point to a lot of important information on the court website. Similarly, uh, a lot of filing practices aren't accessible from the standpoint of uh, the way lawyers put their filing, put their paper books as they are called here, which is the whole compilation consisting of the main petition as well as the documents that they are relying on. That they what they do is they print them and then they you know make all kinds of markings on them sometimes they are scanned mm -hmm. using inferior quality scanners they tend to photocopy them mm -hmm. and then they are uploaded so then that becomes it's very faint sometimes the font you can't make things out and OCR also doesn't help in those contexts that much so then that is the status quo uh, that mm -hmm. that obtains so therefore what uh, he did my boss was to put it out in his cause list that all filings had to be made in soft copy form. Uh, but not only that, that they shouldn't be scanned, printed and scanned. When you say that they should be PDFs, they shouldn't be prepared after printing and scanning, um, mm. which was a major step in terms of making things better for me. Now, of course, not everyone complied with that and that was only for a subset of the filings that we were working with in his court, but it was still a step in the right direction. And there's only so much that one person can do 
or that one clerkship can do to improve things. But from the perspective of my own experience, it was definitely, uh, you know, a very positive experience. And I was able to get a lot out of it, notwithstanding the accessibility barriers that I faced on an everyday basis. Um, so that is how I would put it. I, I, I would also say one final thing on this question, which is that even when people are well-intentioned and understanding and willing to empathize, sometimes market forces take over in the context mm -hmm. of the law firm, especially. And this has been true of experiences that friends of mine have had working at commercial law firms with blindness. Even if the firm is willing to support them, if your disability means that you can't produce the work product in the same timelines as your able-bodied counterparts and that you will sometimes not be able to no matter how good you are because you just need to OCR those documents that are inaccessible that are image-based PDFs you need to troubleshoot so many accessibility issues which takes time so they might end up preferring an able-bodied person instead especially if uh, if billable hours are at issue especially mm -hmm. if you are to compete with your with other firms which are getting the job done much quicker so accessibility suffers at the altar of efficiency right. sometimes i i can see that and and you know the, the quest for for revenue and the, the quest the i guess the capitalistic structure in which everything is built can definitely compromise and, that yes and one distinction that I sometimes make is between the Friday evening view of accessibility versus the Monday morning view of accessibility, as I like to call it, which is essentially that if you ask someone in the abstract, uh, whether they would be willing to accommodate a lawyer with a disability, whether they would be willing to provide this, that, this or that support, whether they would be willing to bargain with their clients if they had to in the interest of fostering greater diversity and walking the talk, in mm -hmm. the abstract, a lot of right thinking people would say only yes to that. If someone doesn't say yes to that, even in the abstract, then, well, that's a different conversation altogether. Right. Right. But most people will. But then when you actually get down to it and uh, when you have to get these things done within the constraints of the market and other factors that I've just laid out and you also spoke to, then it becomes a much different, uh, very different issue and different kettle of fish altogether. Right. I, I like that phrase, Monday versus Friday. Yeah. Um, do you find that um, there are avenues in the legal field that in the legal profession that aren't open at all to people with disabilities? Are, are there some that are easier or are less subject to you know, the efficiency and the market forces that would uh, affect an employer's willingness to accommodate? I think I wouldn't subscribe to the notion that a disabled person should choose their, a disabled lawyer should choose their career path based on their disability. Mm -hmm. um, there is a notion in some quarters and I have myself been at the receiving end of this that if you are a lawyer with a disability you would be better off doing a desk job mm. which is to say working at a commercial law firm or doing other kinds of you know desk jobs in the law maybe being a paralegal or mm -hmm. being a more supporting role that kind of thing rather than litigating in the courts or being in the judiciary right. because the latter category of work is considered more fast paced and uh, and therefore hard faster paced i should say and uh, you know harder to get done uh, as a disabled person but i don't think you know i wrote an article last year called battle for equal productivity dignity uh that was the title of the article in which i said that those who make this argument are really looking at the issue the wrong way mm. the premise should not be 
that this is the way we do things. These are the timelines that we adopt and therefore must comply with them. If you don't, too bad. It mm. can't be like that. Instead, the premise has to be that we are going to be inclusive and accessible. We are going to do, your, do our best to support you to the extent that we can. Tell us what your additional needs are and we will try to reconfigure our practices to the extent that we are able to, to accommodate you. Now, of course, it's not, nobody is saying that it has to be done up to an endless point. There is a limiting principle and in the law that is undue burden, disproportionate or undue burden, when providing an accommodation constitutes a disproportionate or undue burden, you no longer have to do it. But that is a far cry from just refusing to support someone at all because mm -hmm. you feel that it will require you to change the status quo. Well, of course it will. Right. Uh, that's the whole point of reasonable accommodation. By definition, it requires a departure from the status quo. Avoidable complications, therefore, as some people call them, are bound to arise. The question is not if they are going to arise. They are. The question is only if they will cause a disproportionate or undue burden. Mm -hmm. That is the test that you have to determine to see whether or not you can do something uh, as a disabled person. Uh, so therefore, you have to start from the premise of inclusion rather than that of exclusion. And therefore, I don't think it's okay either for an employer to push disabled lawyers in the direction of doing certain kinds of work or for the disabled lawyer to think that they can only do certain kinds of work. Blind yeah. lawyers and disabled lawyers can do all kinds of work and they should be allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. Not allowed. Allowed is the wrong word. They should not be stopped from doing so. Right. right. I... In the in the same lens, you know, you you mentioned before, you know, the problems with legal research databases, the problems with long legal texts and things like that, and how having you know the transcripts and and audio reading through all the different software. I'm curious how COVID, if COVID has affected accessibility, and if if remote work has affected accessibility in that way. So I think it has definitely, and in a couple of ways at least that immediately come to mind. In the context of disabilities like mine, where digital access is really far superior to access to hard copy material, it has, uh, it has been a change agent for making people use digital materials more. At the Supreme Court, for instance, where I worked this past year, they, until now, had the practice of all filings being made in hard copy form until last year, hard copy mm -hmm. form. And uh, making them available in soft copy form would only be as an exception. Now, that wasn't something that uh, they, there had been efforts in the past to change that but they had come to not on a number of occasions. So therefore, they did they, 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 they end up doing it like that. And if, if I were to look in that circumstance, mm. they would have had to scan files just for me, which of course would have been done, but it would have been another accommodation that I would have needed. Right. But because they were operating during COVID, which meant they was, everyone was working virtually and access to physical files was much harder, they switched over to, the, to digital filings. And not all judges did. Some were still unable, unwilling to embrace technology, but some did. And that worked to my advantage uh, to, to, to an extent. Of course, digitization alone does not equate to greater accessibility because unless you configure it with accessibility in mind, it can make things worse or reinforce or perpetuate existing barriers in cyberspace are taking them. I think uh, for a lot of people, and I'm sure you are already aware of this, but for people with other kinds of disabilities, like say chronic fatigue syndrome, 
um, or you know other uh, issues which prevent you from being able to go to the workplace on an everyday basis. Mm-hmm. COVID has been a positive uh, has has uh, been the catalyst for positive change because it has meant access to flexible working arrangements mm-hmm. whereby you don't have to be in the office and therefore that means that um, you know you're able to address your disability related needs a lot better and that has of course led to some a feeling of resentment in the disability community also because people have been saying that two things they is they have been saying one we were asking for this all along why is it that it was not done all these years and now suddenly because you the able bodied can't survive in mm. you know in a physical work setup because of covid now you are changing so that has led to a lot of resentment and justifiable anger some doctors yeah like um, it took a whole pandemic for you to just digitize your files yeah that's right exactly and uh, so that is one aspect of it and uh, the second thing that people have been saying is that look now you know right now now you know what it means to face bad years because covid has made you face additional challenges uh, as you as in the able bodied face additional challenges and therefore uh, you know it it's given people a sense of what it means to have to face uh, additional barriers at the place and everything else now, of course we shouldn't get into as uh, one person at abhin dorma or uh olympics of victimhood um, in terms of figuring out who's suffering is worse mm. that's not the way to look at it i don't buy that kind of thinking right. but i do think that it is right to question why it is that it would be in a pandemic that mm-hmm. we are thinking of these accommodation do you see this come up a lot in your book it can be done which was launched last december do you do you find that the people that you know you spoke to with that book or or even in yourself do you find that this discussion was also pretty relevant in there as well or or did you mostly focus on other things not this in particular because uh, this book uh, was the product of interviews that we conducted in 2000 and between 2016 to 18 in last part there were a couple that were done last year also just before the launch but most were done the nice. covid wasn't really on the horizon uh, just to tell you a little more about the so the idea behind the book was really to chronicle the experiences of legal professionals with disabilities uh, from different jurisdictions to be able to showcase how it is that they have addressed the additional barriers that their disability poses at the workplace in law school the courts and beyond um, and thereby to be able to demonstrate the practical examples that once this additional support is provided there is nothing that a lawyer with a disability cannot do that like they can thrive in the most high pressure work environment and climb the upper echelons of the profession mm-hmm. and uh, that was the so that was the intent with which we started uh, conducting these interviews It wasn't meant to be a very comprehensive project when it started. But over a period of time, it grew, uh, and we ended up being able to speak with twenty-one interviewees with all kinds of disabilities. A majority of the interviewees are blind, so there is that uh, tilt. I admit, but there are many other disabilities like hearing impairment, cerebral palsy. uh deaf blindness uh that we have locomotor disability that we have covered in the book and uh, we've covered people with all kinds of uh you know professional 
profiles uh, in the law, judges at the highest courts in the US, there is one interview featuring that David S. Tatel um, to serve on the DC circuit. He just recently retired and blind uh, South African constitutional court judge, which is their highest court, is also blind law professors, uh, young lawyers, legal academics. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. And then we thought that now that we put all these interviews together, it would be good to get them published in the form of a book as a compilation of all the interviews. And that's what we did in the form of this book. Hmm. Uh, what were some key takeaways from the book or, or big insights that you found? how similar a lot of the challenges that disabled lawyers face in several jurisdictions are. You mm -hmm. might think that life as a blind lawyer in India would be radically different from how it is in the US, but you'd be surprised to know that that's often not the case. A lot of challenges that you and I have spoken about, Michelle, uh, today um, are applicable across the board. Uh, having to work with difficult timelines, having to advocate for yourself, figuring out the right technological solutions for you that are able to be to help you be efficient. Um, you know, getting into workplaces with a supportive environment where your needs are well understood. Uh, these are very common challenges across the board. That was a big insight. Another one was uh, how with the right kind of, how, how obtaining the right kind of support, you know, how it is that you can do that. I think that was something that, uh, that was important. So a lot of interviewees shared how they were able to, and, and this really varied widely. So some like, these two judges that I told you about previous question in response to that relied on rely and did they were in judicial office a lot on cited support because they are older men they aren't that well versed with the use of technology mm -hmm. and therefore for them cited support was very critical probably younger lawyers talk about how they use jaws which is the screen reader that the client uses, as we spoken about briefly before, um, and how to optimize it to produce the best possible results. So a lot of practically oriented insights, not a lot of fluffy, you know, high sounding language in terms of, oh, look, you can pursue all your dreams and so on. And of course, that is important to set the tone, but very concrete insights on what practically can be done in different situations. And then the third big insight was how, and I'm saying this on the fly, so I mean, it may not be as comprehensive as I would have oh, given don't. if I had. <laughs> but yeah, so one other insight that really is how candid. Uh, and up uh, and you know how transparent people were about sharing their experiences mm. just detail for instance when we asked him if it took him longer to get work done than his able-bodied cited colleagues and how he deals with that he said that well that's a hard question because it does take me longer he spoke about how despite being a federal judge when he goes to airports people often talk to his wife, not to him directly mm. because of his disability. Justice Yaku spoke about how he couldn't get a job early on in his career because no one was willing to bank on him. And, you know, he, I think, applied to 30, 40 places, but nothing worked out before he eventually take. Uh, and there are many such examples where people have shared Mr. Umta, who's this Indian lawyer we interviewed, uh, was a senior advocate at the Delhi High Court, and mm -hmm. is the one person who has done a lot of disability rights work that I said earlier. He spoke about how he faced discrimination from 
particular judges because of his disability or he perceived it as such. There was one judge, at least, about whom he spoke that way, spoke about the concrete barrier that he's faced in pushing for policy change. So they weren't just painting a rosy picture without acknowledging, well, some did, but uh, we were able to get them to share very transparently how they were able to deal with their challenges. Mm. Mm. I wanted to elaborate on the point. You said the second thing was, um, you mentioned how older judges relied so much more on unsighted people. And it seems that people of the younger generations uh, who have disabilities are much more independent because of familiarity with software and, and comfort with that. Um, there was an Indian Supreme Court judgment in January 2019, which affirmed the view that those with visual or hearing impairment in excess of 50% couldn't become judges. And in your view, what do you think undermines that thinking, especially now that you have access to software and more types of help besides just cited help uh, that could make becoming a judge much more accessible and after speaking with so many judges yourself? I think it's just a question of lack of um, awareness of the law, of the idea of reasonable accommodation, unfamiliarity with the way people with disabilities work, and also the, the way our legal system operates, where judges have so much workload and pressure which means that they are not able to necessarily devote a lot of time and energy to every matter, which means therefore that they end up passing some judgments which are quite atrocious. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it just a function of the fact that they are not able to think through it as carefully as might have otherwise happened. Of course, that doesn't excuse it, but it might help explain it somewhat. Now, in terms of the other barriers, though, that I've outlined, I think uh, uh, in that case, which is the Surendra Mohan versus the state of Tamil Nadu, the court absolutely refused to acknowledge the principle of reasonable accommodation. Mm. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even argued before them in terms of reasonable accommodation, uh, which it should have been. Uh, and that was after the UNCRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities had been signed and ratified by India 13 years after that, three years almost after our new disability rights law had come into force. Mm -hmm. And yet the court adopted such a regressive stance because they were innocent of the principle of reasonable accommodation of the experiences of judges with disability who have succeeded despite their impairment and uh, the relevant tests to be deployed to determine if an accommodation is reasonable. Now, Judge Shumowski, when we interviewed him, the San Diego County Court retired judge who blind, said this, uh, you know, if you were to go blind as a judge in India while on the bench, and then told that despite access to training and adaptive tech, will no longer be able to discharge your responsibilities as a judge. How would you feel? And I don't think that that is something that these judges delivering the judgment really thought of. Mm. They just uh, were completely ignorant of the lived experiences of the disabled. Now, I'm happy to report, however, Mm. that in the course of uh, my job at the Supreme this past year, I worked on a judgment and we, as in Justice Chandra Jules, from our, in our team worked on a judgment which uh, overturned that uh, ruling and the court uh, there held that just because you have this disability that can't be a basis for you to be denied access to information. And that uh, this judgment, which was delivered in 2019, longer good law, because it was innocent of the principle of reasonable 
application. Mm. So that 2019 judgment no longer holds the field. Well, congratulations on overturning that. I, it's such a big step. Um, yes, yes. From coming from a place of such a lack of empathy on the Supreme yes. Court's part. Um, yes. I, from this conversation, you know, I'm personally just realizing how the legal field has been making progress, but also where we need to really step up, especially in the able-bodied community to make sure that, you know, we not just accommodate, but better, not just uh, better accept the, the different limitations and their various accommodations as, as more commonplace and, and more doable and, and less restrictive. And so with that in mind, I, I just wanted to end our conversation with any final thoughts that you may have on anything that we've spoken to or any reflections that you have um, or anything that you want the general public, legal and otherwise to know about your experiences and about disability in the legal field? No, I think we had a fairly comprehensive conversation. Um, and you asked a great question, a very, a very perceptive and thoughtful and engaged just now. Grateful to you for that and for asking me well thought out for us, um, which I'm sure our listeners which I'm hopeful our listeners uh, will benefit from hearing um, and putting into practice some of the simple yet profound idea discussed. She said it's often about having the right attitude, demonstrating empathy, being willing to ask, having a mind operating from the premise of inclusion. And also standing up when it really counts mm -hmm. and being willing to walk the talk so as to transform Friday evening view of accessibility mm -hmm. into the Monday morning accessibility. <laughs> so that is what it is. And I think it's only through that kind of proactive, thoughtful effort that we can and not, not exposed factor, not showing that after when it really matters, mm. but being very thoughtful and considerate about how you act in the moment and taking into account how what you are doing might affect someone with disability around. Mm. If you are playing games which are visually oriented to your friends during the pandemic to stay in touch, pause, pause and spare a thought for how your disabled friend might be better included in that activity. Mm -hmm. If you are putting up a picture on Instagram without an image description, spare a thought for how that might exclude you know, a disabled friend from being able to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. If you're uh, thinking of uh, getting someone part of your, become part of your law journey, as a, as a law review in the American context, I'm saying, spare a thought for how a disabled person might be able to do the work effectively and how you should support them if they need any support in that regard. Mm -hmm. If you if you have a colleague with a disability and if you see them uh, struggling, trying to get onto the escalator, don't grab them. Try to ask them if they actually require support. Mm -hmm. And just because they seem to be taking a little longer to do something, don't assume that they are necessarily lost or mm -hmm. in need of help. Ask them first. So it's a lot of these small little, I'm not saying that bigger infrastructural changes are not needed. They are. And like I said, some of the work that we did at the Supreme Court, for example, addressed that digital accessibility, 
you know, making sure that uh, you have equal opportunity policies, better ways of accessing reasonable accommodation. Those things are important, but equally, or even fact, often more so, is your behavior on an everyday basis. If your disabled friend is telling you about some challenges that they have faced as a consequence of their disability, try to offer them some words of comfort and solidarity and understanding. Don't dismiss their challenges or respond in an offhand way or not respond at all. Mm -hmm. You know, take the time out to respond to them with some amount of thoughtfulness and consideration. Thank you so much for your insight and your guidance. And I'm sure that all of our, our listeners and viewers will take that to heart. And I know I will definitely start examining my life a little bit more with the thought of accessibility in mind and, and take some time to think in my everyday activities. How is this for someone else? And how can we make it easier for someone else? So I just want to say thank you so much for speaking with me. Uh, this has been uh, Rahul Bajaj uh, and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharky. It's been an honor to interact with you and pleasure has all. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs>